Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. It's Friday. Um, if you're listening live, it's raining. If you're listening back, hopefully the sun has come out for you between now and then. Uh, but very excited because today we are talking about my favourite topic, which is teaching. And I'm absolutely delighted that we've got a very special guest uh, coming to talk to us today, an expert in the field of teacher training. So without further ado, good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Poppy. Hi, can you hear me? Yay! I can hear you perfectly. Hi. <laughs> How exciting. Great to be How here exciting. with you today. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. I'm good, thanks. Could do with a bit more sunshine, but um, I'm good. I'm glad to be speaking to you. Thank you for having me. Oh, we are absolutely delighted because I'm just so keen. I've got so many of my students, Jenny, looking at getting into teacher training. They're looking at different pathways. So I'm hoping you can clear up a lot of questions for us today, if that's yeah, OK. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's that time of year. There's lots of stuff in the news as well, which I suppose we might touch on. And it's actually mm -hmm. quite a um, contentious topic in education. And I know you have a big following for uh, Teachers Talk Radio on Twitter. So I'm sure people will have a view on what we're talking about, which is great. Definitely, definitely. And yes, just to say that if you are listening live with me and Jenny um, up till 12 o'clock today, you can type questions in the live chat um, and I can put them to Jenny at the end of the show. So do feel free to get involved, type your message on Podbean and we can ask Jenny. Um, so I guess before, uh, and I'll be honest, Jenny, I've got quite a list of questions for you. <laughs> as I've got your expertise here with me um but I thought maybe could you please start introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us about your career journey up to this point please I will do love to so yes yeah, I'm Jenny Fogarty I'm currently director of initial teacher training at Anglia Ruskin University ARU so mm -hmm. I cover the uh three sites where we'll be rolling out ITT from September 2024. So that's across the Eastern region, Chelmsford, Cambridge and Peterborough. And um, I've had that job not for very long, actually. I started it in March this year, but I've always uh, been involved in ITT. But I started um, myself, I did a B.Ed. back in the day, as we say, back uh, in the early noughties. And <laughs> I uh, qualified and... Um, taught in Hertfordshire and Essex schools and I became a deputy head quite quickly and then I was doing a couple of acting headships both my deputy head roles my um, heads took a uh, long-term sick unfortunately and when you're a, a head teacher a deputy head you have to act up so I did that wow. for, twice and then twice and as well intense. yeah I know <laughs> I know you can't get more unlucky than that um, and I was still very young at the time but I was doing my master's degree alongside it so I studied at the University of Cambridge for an MED in leading teaching and learning and that was back in the day wow. when uh, the local authority paid for it so I was lucky enough to have that paid for uh, through the local authority but I had to apply and you know it was quite a rigorous process to get on that but that was the Hearts Cam uh, leading teaching and learning degree and there's still a big community now so um, shout out to all those colleagues because they were brilliant that was a really transformative learning experience for me but I did have quite a kind of bumpy uh, leadership time it was really intense and obviously acting up mm -hmm. is a lot twice and, yeah <laughs> twice is a lot and I, I took some time out and went and taught overseas I taught in the Caribbean had a had a break and then when I came back I thought okay what can I do with my skill set I don't really know if I want to go back into school mm -hmm. I'm not sure I want to be do headship anymore and I had some great colleagues and friends around me that said you know why not try teacher training why not get into teacher education so I did that for a good few years in London. I led the PGCE school direct route at London South Bank. And then after about five or six years doing that, I took a sideways move and I started working at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which is an amazing wow. niche, small university that nobody had heard of until COVID. And these guys do amazing work around public health and public health education. And I was an assistant professor in learning and teaching there. So I used to work with colleagues who were kind of doctors and public health specialists helping them wow. teach their master's level students so I basically ran like the PG cert in higher education but I did it for doctors and, and uh, medical colleagues and public health and allied health loads of really amazing international colleagues as well and it was a really good opportunity for me to kind of use my skill set in a different context and I think that's something we might pick up on today is that you know often teachers think oh, I can only teach in a school Whereas actually you have amazing transferable skills 
And sometimes it's about thinking laterally about where they mm-hmm. might fit. Mm-hmm. And I loved that job at LSHTM. I really loved it. And um, amazing colleagues taught overseas, went out with the UK public health rapid support team that were brought in after Ebola and did capacity building work. And wow. it also allowed me to do my other passion, which was teaching in prison. So I know, Poppy, you have had experience with Inside Out, which is a, um, mm-hmm, a prison mm-hmm. education program. And I did learning together and I used to teach in Brixton Brilliant. and um, Pentonville prisons and loved that and, and did a lot of good work there. And then COVID kind of came along and lots of us thought, what do we want to do? How do mm-hmm. we want to do things differently? Lots of colleagues at LSHGM went back into clinical roles. So the work really kind of changed. And so I took a what I call a professional sabbatical. I took a year out to work in my local hospice and I used to, well, I helped them with the move to digital education. So all their education and training that they used to do for end of life care, um, they had to turn it online. And obviously, as you can imagine during COVID, there was a big demand for helping people have good deaths. And it's something that I've become very passionate about since my experience at the hospice. And then I was looking for another role after that year. So I, um, did some part-time work I was freelancing and um, then the opportunity to work at ARU came along and I'd been the external examiner at ARU for um, about five years and have known colleagues there for a long time so I was delighted to be involved with this work so that's quite a long answer to your question Poppy sorry. (laughs) <laughs> well, no, I mean, that was an amazing answer. I feel like I need the Jenny series on <laughs> Teachers Talk Radio because I want to ask you so many questions about everything there. I mean, what? thank you for sharing that with us, first of all. And one thing I just have to ask you about that you mentioned, and I think I got this right, teaching in the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. So... Tell us more, please, just before I get onto the list of questions. Well, that was that was a kind of slight detour, but I I got a job in a international school. So, you know, that job was advertised on the TES, like we all see jobs when we're teaching. And mm-hmm. um I just thought I need to do something completely different. There were lots of aspects in my life that I wanted to change at the time. And yeah. I just thought I'm gonna go and try it. And you know, I'm sure you've got listeners that have done expat teaching. It's a it's a very different way of teaching. I taught in a on a tiny island called Canoan in St Vincent in the Grenadines, and um, yeah, I, I suppose all I can say is, is it was an experience, Poppy. It was wow. definitely an experience, um, and it was an opportunity for me to really sit on the beach and think, what do I want out of my life? And um, I did I did do the teaching, and I enjoyed it, and I met some very cool people and had cool experiences. And I was, you know, ready for that. It marked a kind of transition point in my life um, mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. I moved from classroom teaching into academic work. And for me, having a sense of belonging has always been really important in my roles and feeling like I'm connected to the values of the organisation that I work with are really important. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. that's why I love being an academic, because I get to work with people who are very values driven. And that's why teaching so great. Wow, I love this. And I also just love that the universe, you know, made this pathway for you. And now you're here <laughs> with us, inspiring the next generation of teachers. So amazing. So let, let's move on to, to talking about teacher training. Then, because I know I've got lots of my students at the moment that are listening in um, and want to know more about teacher training. And one thing that they've been asking me about are the changes that are coming in to teacher training from September 2024. 20, and I wondered if you could please tell us a bit more about what that means. Yeah. So from a student perspective, it shouldn't actually mean that much. It shouldn't make too much of a difference to them. But there was a um, there was a a big market, what they call the market review of teacher training providers last year in 2022. And it was a very um, challenging time to be a, um, a provider. Still is a challenging time to be a provider because actually, providers had to reapply to the Department for Education to be accredited to award qualified teacher status. And their applications were reviewed um, in quite a cloak and dagger way, not a very transparent way about what they were looking for. And then there were two stages where the government announced who the providers were going to be from 2024. So everybody Mm -hmm. who will be delivering qualified teacher status or awarding qualified teacher status they've been re-accredited but Mm -hmm. actually about 20 percent of providers were not re-accredited wow so like a fifth wow yeah a huge proportion of both school-based providers so the skits and hei university providers and we're talking about providers with very long well-established histories of excellent teacher education right across the country and they reckon it 
will work out that we'll be about 9,000 places down in 2024. Yeah, so it's a big change and it's really been a big shake up and it's not been uncontentious. So um, it's it's really changed what the landscape is going to look like. Of course, the the DfE remain committed to a schools based agenda. So lots of skits. But we know that university providers have a really amazing history and legacy of really combining excellent research and theory with the practice and the long-term relationships with schools, whether that's through CPD, masters, Mm -hmm. as well as teacher training. So, you know, I'm very proud of university-based teacher training, and I know we'll have listeners that feel very strongly about that as well. So it's Mm -hmm. a big change. And so what might look different for training for potential trainees is that some of the providers who they thought they were going to do their teacher training with aren't doing it anymore or yeah. they might be in new partnerships. So some of the providers that weren't accredited have partnered up with regional prov- other providers okay. to become what we call a lead partner. So they might be delivering aspects of either the curriculum or the school based training. So it's actually a little bit messy. Um, so it's important to ask that question if you're going to go out and look for a new training uh, provider or you want to train to teach asking the question of like who's accrediting this you know if that is important to you that's definitely a question that you can ask because I guess that means that's how you'd have the the graduation at the accrediting so yeah so this happened to me actually Jenny so when I was teacher training I was at Edge Hill University but it wasn't the university yet it was Edge Hill College um and I didn't realize so it was it was accredited by I think it was Lancaster and I had to go for my graduation there and it felt really strange because you know we'd all spent three years on campus um, and then we had to go to this other university for the graduation. So, yeah, I guess that's a really good thing just to check and be aware of. Yeah, it d- and it shouldn't really matter day to day. You know, my sister did a, a ballet degree at the Royal Academy of Dance and she was a- accredited by Surrey. So went out to have her graduation in Guildford. It was the first and only time she ever went there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is just something to ask if you're, you know, if you're interested in what's happening. It's good to know why and how and what, and what difference it's going to make to you as a trainee. Definitely. And then just to pick up then, you said, you know, about a fifth of providers weren't re-accredited. Does, does this mean it's much more competitive at the moment to get on to teacher training places? Well, we don't know is, is the real answer to that. I'm sure some people will tell you they do know, but I think we don't know because the the landscape in terms of how people are partnering is different. So they, they're making potentially cuts in some areas, but they'll grow in other areas. So the number of places as well is different to the demand for teacher training so that we know Mm -hmm. actually um, primary holds up pretty strongly and is quite steady year to year but in secondary subjects they're not meeting recruitment targets so there's not this number of trainees coming in but like all these things if it's something you're passionate about we would always encourage potential students to apply early because there is uncertainty in the landscape so it's definitely best particularly if you're thinking about an undergraduate route like a b ed to get that application in early because those have, have always been traditionally very competitive routes compared to pgces brilliant thank you jenny that's so helpful it's time for a fresh start to language learning Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. So welcome to everyone who's listening. So we've got lots and lots of listeners online this morning. You're here on Teachers Talk Radio with me, Poppy, and we are talking to an expert of teacher education, Jenny Fogarty. Hello, Jenny. Hello, Poppy. Hello. So we've been talking this morning about some of the changes to teacher training. Um, But I'm really interested to pick up on your journey because you were telling Mm -hmm. us earlier on that you started out as a teacher, but now you're working at university level and, you know, you moved into being a teacher educator uh, and now your current role. How and why did you make that change? And I know a lot of my students say to me, like, how did you end up going from being a primary school teacher to, to working with adults? Like, what was the journey for you, Jenny? Well, I 
think for me, what was really a pivotal point was doing my master's. I don't know if you agree, Poppy, when you do your master's and you have an opportunity to research an area in depth, it really brings you alive in a different way, I think, in terms of your career. And there are often opportunities linked to that where you can contribute to the university where you're doing your master's. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you might be asked to present your research or you might be asked to go along to a seminar or be part of a kind of broader research community that's in um, higher education. So I had that strand. And then I always had the strand of having my own trainees. So being a class teacher, deputy head, um, having a class and having trainees from the university Uh, Mm -hmm. or the local provider coming in and I used to love that used to love that kind of mentoring and seeing people grow and develop and the university tutors used to come in and I would say how do you get to do your job I'd love to say this how do you you get to go around um, and visit other schools and talk to people and they'd say to me you need to do your master's if you want to work in higher education Mm -hmm. you must do your master's but then go back to your universities go back to um Um, contact local universities and see if they're looking for people they're always looking for people that might want to be interested in teacher education so when I came back from the um, the Caribbean and decided that this was the route I was going to take it was just I was just applying for jobs just I needed to work I didn't want to go back into school I think when we have these moments of of transition in our life we always tell ourselves as teachers well I can always do supply You know, Mm -hmm. I could always be a supply Mm -hmm. teacher if if I needed to. And of course, you can do that. And that's a great way to kind of think about what you want from a school. But I knew I didn't want a full time school based role. And so I applied I applied for jobs. There's a great website called jobs.ac.uk, which has higher education jobs in it and um, teacher education roles were coming up. And I just applied for it. And I think what people need to remember if they're coming out of school is that your school experience has such a high value in universities and particularly in teacher education you know that credibility mm-hmm. in the classroom mm-hmm. with trainees yeah, is definitely. really valuable and people like me and you Poppy we get further and further away from that right so that's why we diversify what we are into and in our research to bring in other skills but our colleagues that come in straight from school of course it's a transition it's a huge transition mm-hmm. um but it's a really worthwhile one and it gives you an opportunity to do all the things you love about teaching with less of the things that you don't love and actually teaching adults is not that different (laughs) (laughs) I think people think it's way different yeah it's actually not it you know are you a good communicator can you explain things can Mm -hmm. you enthuse people can you inspire and use get people talking about some stuff that they're passionate about yes we can do all of that as teachers and 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 can you still use your teacher stare when someone's you (laughs) know going on Instagram at the back of the lecture (laughs) theatre excuse me yeah (laughs) yes we can still use all the those all those skills but you know lecturing is a skill I remember the first time I stood up in a lecture theatre with you know 150 students in that is Mm -hmm. different than doing assembly you tell yourself it's the same it's it is different you have got to remember things but the great thing about working in good universities is that you'll have an amazing team around you that will support you to make that transition and Mm -hmm. I think that's really important but you know, I did have to have my master's, I did have to have an idea about research that I wanted to develop and contribute to. But actually, I think just taking a leap of faith, just thinking like, this is the environment I want to be in, this is what I want to do. And that's always been a theme for me throughout my career is, if I don't like something, I'll change it. And I think often I meet with teachers, particularly at the end of the year, my husband is is still a teacher in school, he's an assistant head in London, and I will Mm -hmm. go to the pub at the end of the term, and I'll say, you don't want to do it anymore do something different yeah you know and feeling empowered to make that change sometimes people think what you know what could I do and teacher education is a great way of keeping alive all the things that you love about the classroom and you're still going into primary schools if that's your thing you're still visiting secondary settings if that's your background Mm -hmm. you're just doing it in a different way exactly that's such good advice Jenny I I think you're right a lot of those skills are transferable whether you're teaching a six-year-old or a 60-year-old and um, another really good advice there Jenny take a risk and I know a lot of teachers at the moment you know we've seen a lot of strikes this year and they think it's teaching for me but the fact that you trained to be a teacher and you have been teaching there's clearly something in you that enjoys that role and yeah you're right Jenny maybe it's about thinking do I need to be in a different classroom in a different space 
you know work with a different year group even adults and yeah so really good advice I think for those teachers you might be feeling disillusioned um don't think that means you're not meant to teach anymore maybe you're just meant to teach somewhere else and something else right absolutely and you know there are maybe the Caribbean which I'm wondering why maybe the Caribbean (laughs) maybe the Caribbean but maybe not right maybe it's not you know lots of people are embedded in their communities they might have families they can't move they can't do what I did and get you know up sticks and leave but you can talk to colleagues that are doing interesting jobs around you that's always been a real thing for me when I felt a bit stuck in my career is looking at my professional network whether that's on Twitter whether that's people you know in real life and saying you're doing something interesting. Can I talk to you about how you got there? And I find often that is really um, transformative for me in my thinking is to just think, okay, right, I just need to slightly reframe this or move in another direction or just think about what I really do enjoy or what am I not prioritizing and just taking that time out. I like to do a little kind of career MOT after Christmas every year where I just think, (laughs) am I on the right track? Is this going in the right direction? what could I do differently? And you, I know, like you, don't have, that. you don't have to be a teacher to do that. But I think it's just, there's something about being intentional and not just letting the years yeah. drift away because in school, before you know it, another academic year has gone by. Yeah, because you're always just looking for the next half term, the next break, aren't you? It just Absolutely. whizzes by. And yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's really good advice. As you say, Jenny, for anyone listening, you know, whatever your role is, or if you're a teacher, just, just think what is the future? And obviously we want to live in the present. That's really important. But think you know where would you like to go is there a subject you want to specialize in or particularly like you said Jenny about doing your master's about doing your PhD like a lot of my students when I say one day you might do a PhD like me and they like laugh they like snigger and I'm like no but you might not even know yet like I when I was 18 in the classroom at uni I did never think I would do a PhD um because I'd pretty much hated education my whole life (laughs) but but as you grow and change like that's part of the beauty is embracing who you are now and so yeah definitely absolutely and I think it's find out masters and yeah not shutting down options not saying oh I could never do that or I hated this you know maybe it's maybe you've changed since you were studying at uni 20 years ago maybe maybe you feel maybe uni's changed as well absolutely (laughs) university has changed in a big way Absolutely. And you can do it in small stages. You know, we have roles in uh, ARU and other organisations do as well, where you could be a lecturer practitioner. So you could still maintain time in the classroom, but you mm-hmm. could be teaching in university one or two days a week. That's a great way of trying it out or, you know, doing a part time master's, just taking it one module at a time, not feeling overwhelmed with it, but just taking it bit by bit. And before you know it, it could open up all sorts of other doors, to, you know, in your career and your life, actually. Wow. Oh, that's so inspirational. And I love that, Jenny, because actually my very first master's I did, um, I did through an online provider right. um, and had had my baby at the same time. And weirdly, my master's was my me time. Yes. And I know there are some of you listening that will get it. Like, actually, when you are a busy educator, getting to just sit on your laptop and type an essay is your you time. And it's so empowering. Absolutely. Really empowering, particularly, you know, for parents and carers. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, we, some of you from your theoretical learning of your teachers will know the theory about flow and how you get into that kind of headspace and you want the classrooms where the children say at the end oh when the bell goes (laughs) you know when do we have moments like that for ourselves you know and I think often research and reading and writing about things that you're passionate about for me they are my moments of flow where I can completely be um, absorbed in something and that's Mm -hmm. you know they're very precious moments and you know we get an opportunity in teacher education to stop and think while still always, you know, being aware of the very real pressures of what it takes to be a teacher and having the kind of straddling two areas, I think. And that's that's really exciting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So true. I love that. So before Jenny convinces me to sign up for another degree, uh, <laughs> we are going to jump to the news. So Jenny, don't go anywhere. And we'll be back with you in about seven minutes time. Thank Speak you. To you soon. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. 
Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go, well-being and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. BBC News reports that the school run by Ruth Perry, who took her own life after a critical Ofsted, has been rated good after a new inspection. Ms Perry died in January after receiving news her school was being downgraded from outstanding to inadequate. Ms Perry's death prompted an outpouring of anger about the inspection system, although Ofsted defended its grading process and said one-word gradings would not be scrapped. The latest report comments on the work done by the school to address previous weaknesses. The new report raises again the question of high stakes inspections. MPs are to hold an inquiry in the autumn and will look at how the system is working. Ms Perry's sister, Professor Julia Waters, said in a statement, the reversal of the previous judgment in a matter of months illustrates why schools should be given the time to correct weaknesses before the final report is published and that the latest judgment proves what all of those who knew Ruth and the school have known all along. Last month, Ofsted announced some changes which allow schools that were given an inadequate rating over safeguarding to be re-inspected within three months, giving them a chance to be regraded if they have addressed concerns. Teachers' pay has been in the news again following two further days of strike action from teachers in England. The Daily Mirror reports that Education Secretary Gillian Keegan is continuing to be under pressure to publish pay proposals or risk strikes dragging on even longer. All the major teaching unions in England are conducting fresh ballots after rejecting a £1,000 one-off payment for 2023 and an average 4.5% pay rise for next year. The government referred the decision on pay to the pay review body, who has reportedly recommended a 6.5% pay rise but the DfE continues to refuse to publish the advice. The Guardian reports on Labour's plans for education should they win the next general election. The article itself focused on plans for early years, which could see more graduate teachers working in nurseries and more nursery places in primary school settings. Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Philipson said she wanted to put early years on an equal footing with schools to give children the best start in life. The TES gave further comment on Labour's plans as the party set out how it plans to boost teacher retention and improve standards. The plan includes giving early career teachers a one-off payment of £2,400 for staying in the profession and sending regional improvement teams to help schools. New teachers will be required to have QTS and they will also improve recruitment by cutting costs. The party, currently in opposition, has not made any comment on teacher pay. Finally, the BBC reports on what it describes as a crisis in waiting for children in care. In March, the government extended a ban on unregulated homes to children in care aged 16 and 17. This followed a BBC investigation which found some had been forced to live in caravans and barges and some had experienced abuse. The crackdown begins in October when Ofsted will begin inspections and all unregulated care settings will become illegal. However, some local authorities fear they will have to continue the use of unregulated accommodation, usually in houses and flats in residential areas, because they will have no alternative. Regulated placements are suffering chronic staff shortages and a squeeze on places at the same time as a rise on numbers of children coming into care is causing continued issues. 
A DfE spokesperson said it was the responsibility of local authorities to provide safe placements, but that it was investing £142 million over the next three years to ensure the transition to Ofsted registration is successful. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to support a question everyone will see at the start of next year. It goes something like this. Hi Edu Twitter, can you reply with where you are so I can show my class how far a post on the internet can reach? With a bit of free tech, you can make this much more visual. I'm going to use Google Maps because it's free and most likely you'll have used Google Maps at some point in the past. So, when you have all your responses, sign into Google Go to Maps and click on the menu next to the search box. That's the three lines that look like a burger. From the menu, select My Places. You'll now have four options. Lists, Labeled, Visited and Maps. Click on Maps and at the bottom select Create Map. Now you can give the map a title so you can find it next year for comparison and add all the places from your Twitter replies. Simply type the name of the place. When it appears with a blue point marker, you can click the plus sign to add it to the map and then select the colour to help it stand out. When you're finished, all places will be saved and you can access the map by following the first few steps. Menu, My Places, Maps. There are loads of other great tools to use also. Measure the distance from your school to those places. Hit preview and go into the view only mode. Here you can select the place and you treat it to a short bio and an image of the area. So next time you're looking to bring a lesson to life, why not try using maps to help pupils see where places are in the world? Do you have any top tips for mapping? Why not get in touch and tell us what you want to know about tech? I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. And welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Friday morning break with me, Poppy Gibson. And this morning, we have got a very special guest, Jenny Fogarty. Jenny is an Associate Professor of Education, as well as being the Director of Initial Teacher Training at ARU Essex. So welcome back, Jenny. Hello, Poppy. Hi, everyone. Welcome back, welcome back. And a little shout out, we've got lots of listeners uh, joining in, typing in the studio this morning. We've got Gareth listening in, we've got Mark. Mark sent me a lovely comment um, over the break, Jenny, to say that doing his master's was really valuable for him as a parent as well. So, um, and he's just told me actually he did it on coaching and leadership. So very very interesting. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Mark. <laughs> so Jenny, we've got about another 20 minutes together. Uh, so I've just got a few more questions to uh, to put to you, please, about teacher training. Sure. <laughs> Great. So before the break, we were talking about um, getting into teaching, maybe even becoming a teacher educator like us. Um, but I want to kind of go back a bit to really some of these challenges we're seeing in the sector at the moment around teacher recruitment. And I know some people talk about a teacher crisis. Um, I'm just kind of interested, how do you think these might have changed over time? How have the challenges in teaching maybe changed since COVID? What's your kind of perspective as as a very experienced educator? Yeah, and it's a really interesting time to be having this discussion. So grateful to the team at the NFER. They do a, a lot of good work each kind of every period, every month or so, looking at the trends and the data around teacher recruitment. But also we've had um, an education select committee this week where colleagues from the sector were presenting to the government their thoughts on, you know, is there a crisis? What is happening? And what we see is that, you know, teacher retention bubbles around the 10%. So 10% of teachers drop out each year. And that has been pretty steady. So I think there's, there's, a lot of interest in it seemingly have increased at the moment, gone up to 12%, but actually nobody moved during COVID. That's what we saw. People didn't leave their jobs during COVID. It wasn't mm-hmm. the same kind of round of recruitment in and out. And so it, as we know, in all areas of society, things are taking a time to level out and to find uh, what the new balance is. So in terms of retention I think it's always going to be a challenge in the sector particularly post-covid because of the issues we have around flexible working and I think people more broadly in work have new opportunities for flexible working you know I am a big proponent of what we call agile working I move Mm -hmm, around mm -hmm. you know I'm based all over the east of England so I, I, I have time at home I have time on campus but we just don't have that kind of same flexibility in um 
in our roles you know in school and that can be a challenge and I know that the government are trying to work hard with heads and and leaders in the sector to understand how we can bring more flexible working and I think that will bring a good benefit and Mm -hmm. of course pay pay is an issue you know you know Rishi's announced that they'll accept the um, recommendations yesterday for some people that won't be enough and that's a real uh, you know a real concern and I think Mm -hmm. potentially we're just storing up more issues um, as we continue to see pay eroded over the last 10 years and I think that's really something that we've got to look at particularly where subjects for recruitment get good or big bursaries so some subjects for teacher training particularly in sec you know all in secondary subjects but you know specialist subjects like um where there's shortages you know maths and sciences and areas like that you know they have big bursaries attached to them but if we're still seeing people drop out after a year then that's not a good use of public funds either so we need to be really thinking about how teacher training courses are preparing trainees to have long and full and rich careers in the profession and knowing that those careers might look different over time right so Mm -hmm. how can we build in flexibility to help people see all the different possibilities because we want to support people I've never met a trainee who on day one didn't want to make a difference Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. what happens that in a year two years three years time they suddenly feel they're not able to make that difference and we have to help people understand you know what are the levers that they can pull themselves Mm -hmm. to put themselves in a position where they feel they are able to make a difference perfect so this kind of leaves me I've got a really direct question I want to ask you (laughs) but before I do I just reflecting um so as you know Jenny I did um, a three-year primary teacher course specializing in child psychology with QTS qualified teacher status so I, I was really lucky that I knew I wanted to teach so my first degree had qualified teacher status attached and so I had placements and um really enjoyed the placements didn't enjoy uh I realized I've already named and shamed <laughs> uh didn't always enjoy the teaching but that was about me That's not right. about the institution you know as someone who's neurodivergent it was a long time ago it was yeah, a long time ago um yeah as someone who's neurodivergent I don't always find it easy to um kind of mm-hmm. access and stay engaged with the materials so um but but it was that drive, like you say, that drive to make a difference, that drive to want to be a teacher that kept me um, engaged. And luckily, you know, here we are, however many decades later, still teaching, just in a different way. Um, my question for you, in your opinion, what makes a great teacher training course? I think a course that is about the students and the pupils that they will serve that is grounded in the difference you're going to make you will get a sense of that if you're a prospective trainee going out hearing people at open day if it's less about the institution and more about the work more about what difference it will make to you as a trainee and what difference you will then make as a trainee on the lives of the pupils and the children in your community that is a good sign so often you go around and people are you know navel gazing telling you how amazing they are as an institution and how brilliant they've got so many researchers and how much they're doing themselves actually it's Mm -hmm. not about us (laughs) it's about you it's about what you need it's about how the course can adapt and support you to be the best teacher you can be and I say this a lot in my team that our job is to serve the work it's not about us positioning ourselves as the font of all knowledge come here you will learn from these amazing experts it's about saying you will become the best teacher you can be through the opportunities and support that we provide you Mm -hmm. and you know everywhere you go you will hear people talk about their research some of it will light your fire some of it won't that's great Mm -hmm. that's great that you've got people that are researching that's literally their job (laughs) right that's what they get paid to do so what you need as a as a potential trainee is to understand what is the benefit to you as a trainee what difference is this going to make to you and your practice Mm -hmm. and also to recognize that whether you're doing a one-year pgce or three or four-year undergraduate course life happens life gets in the way of any education you undertake yeah. where's the safety net underneath you what does that look like you might think I'm never going to need that I don't need student support I didn't access any of it on my undergraduate course mm-hmm. still ask those questions still understand what happens if things go wrong things go wrong for all sorts of different reasons and you need to know that you're going to be in an environment that's going to support you and 
challenge you of course you want to be challenged and we want to push you as hard as we can but also Mm -hmm. be there every step of the way to say this is the nudge you need this is what we are after from you and this is the support we're going to put in place because teaching's tough old business and it's really tough to be a trainee and we want to get you through the course and that 120 days in school so really focus in on can you hear them talking about students and trainees and children and young people if they're talking about nss scores and league tables and funding and you know facilities maybe it's not the right environment for you Mm -hmm. maybe you want to go somewhere where there's an amazing sports center fine but think about what is important to you before you get there because you know you'll be surrounded by people that can talk a good talk but actually our job is to support you that's what that's what it's about it's not for us to come and toot our own horn and blow our own trumpet um Mm -hmm. yeah it's really for me about us serving the work I love that. I love that. And I think that's true even when you become a teacher, you know, finding the school that fits for you. So this is the same, isn't it? Find the institution that's going to fit you, fits your vision and values. Jenny, one thing I want to pick up on that you mentioned there, you said, you know, whether you do an undergrad training course or or a PGCE, for our listeners, um, you know, who might be looking at getting into teacher training, could you please just clarify what is the difference then between a B.Ed., I guess that's a Bachelor of Education, um that's right and a pgce could you maybe just tell us a bit about like the difference yeah so there are lots and lots of different ways to get into teaching too many for um that we've only got maybe a few minutes to go so too many for me to go into (laughs) next time we'll have you back for part two (laughs) (laughs) but you can train to be a teacher through an undergraduate route or a post that was like what i did right but mine mine was a ba so mine was a bachelor of arts yeah and that's that's common too it's about the qts bit is the most important bit the ba the b ed bit is kind of used interchangeably Mm -hmm. b ed is a shorthand in the sector for an undergraduate primary education degree with qts so when people say i did a b ed what they mean is they did a a three or four year undergraduate primary education degree with qts so with qualified teacher status So that's the kind of shorthand that people use, but it can be a BA. It's the QTS bit that matters. So do you do an undergraduate course where your subject is education? So you become an expert in education or do you do an undergraduate course in a subject like English or maths or physics or psychology? And then you train to be a teacher through a postgraduate certificate in education. So a PGCE and often a PGCE is 60 master's credits. And um, that's at level seven. So that's at master's level or postgraduate level. But both those routes, that's the academic bit. What you're looking for is the qualified teacher status part. So do they award you qualified teacher status? And that's really the training program that underpins how you learn to become a teacher. And that is where we teach you all about pedagogy, the how of being a teacher. We teach about um, adaptive teaching. We think about assessment. We think about Mm -hmm. your role in the wider community. And that from 2024 is um, also much more closely aligned to what they call the core content framework. So that's almost like a curriculum for teacher training. So that's a a bit of a a whistle stop explanation, but you've got either undergraduate routes where you're really embedded in education or you've got postgraduate routes where you learn, you train to be a teacher on top of your subject expertise, but you have to have a degree to become a teacher. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for clarifying, Jenny. And did I hear you say earlier the number 120 days? Is that like That's how right. many days you have to do on placement? Is that the same, like whatever training route you go down? Yeah, that's right. So in a on a one year course, you have to do that in one year. So that wow. gives you an indication of how many um how much time you would spend at university compared to how much time you would spend in your school setting. And then on an undergraduate course, you do that over a three year or four year timeline. I see. Okay. Yeah. So often on an undergraduate course, you would do more than 120 days because we would build in some flex in case you had, were you absent or something happened and you needed to do extra days. Mm -hmm. But on an undergraduate course, like the one I'm, um, developing you do three eight-week placements one each year whereas on a okay. pgce you have to do it all in one year so pgc is a very very um full-on training year mm-hmm. so i guess yeah it's back to what you're saying like think what would work for you and some people thrive under that pressure don't they uh, yeah. so it's kind of yeah thinking what works for you um and like yeah, you say would... have a chat with the institutions and, and think Absolutely. what would fit your lifestyle 
and think about where you're coming in so if you've already done your undergraduate degree you probably don't want to do another one right so you want to think about what's the quickest way of being a teacher but I think really be mindful if your own consideration is speed you know what's the quickest way because they are very intensive courses whether they're undergraduate with QTS anything with QTS is a very very intensive uh way of learning to be a teacher that's that's part of it that's part of how it's designed so Mm -hmm. you have to be in a really good place kind of all aspects of your life I used to say to my trainees you need to literally get your house in order (laughs) yeah (laughs) good advice (laughs) you know whether that is who's going to look after your dog who's picking up your kids have you got you know meals in the freezer that you can access easily like it's it is it is challenging so as much Mm -hmm. as you can do to prepare for it which is why we would always encourage people to apply early because then you've got a nice long lead in time to get ready definitely get organized yeah I like that get your house in order then you get your classroom in order (laughs) yeah yeah. brilliant thanks Jenny um you'll be pleased to know I've only got two more questions left (laughs) I feel like we've covered a lot though this morning what's the direct one that's what I want to know Poppy you've said I need to ask you a very direct question have you asked it (laughs) it wasn't anything too spicy to say that was me just wondering what you thought made a great course but I totally okay, agree fine. with everything you said. I mean, had okay. I known you wanted more challenging questions, <laughs> fine, I would have you know, preferred. Um, so we've just got a few minutes left. So the next thing just really that I thought would be really useful to share with our listeners, because we've spoken about, you know, these days in school. Could you just tell us maybe a bit more what role then that, that schools and school-based mentors have to play in teacher education? Yeah, they're vital. We couldn't do teacher education without schools and Mm -hmm. without the partnership we have with our school colleagues um, because school-based training is absolutely um, imperative. You know, it's really, really, really an important part of what we are doing and it's an important part of how you learn to be a teacher. You know, we, we, of course, we love the theoretical side, but the practical application is what underpins everything. So schools um, will be part of a training program whether that is through a um, formal partnership and they are a placement school or they might contribute to the teaching so that's another way of um, thinking about how you might become a teacher educator is you could do one-off guest lecturing sessions in universities which is Mm -hmm. um, really something that you could think about as well but yeah I think there is something there about you really being clear Sorry, Poppy, I've, I've lost what I was going to say. I've lost my, th- my thread of my thought there. Can you re-clarify the question for me? Yeah, of course. I know it's been, it's been an intense morning questions for you. But it has. <laughs> you imagine us how vital the school and the school mentors are really school, in supporting our yeah. mm-hmm. Of course it is. Sorry. I'm doing well to get to just before the end of the hour. Thanks, Poppy. <laughs> and it is Friday morning, so we'll <laughs> let you off. Right. We're always a bit like that on a Friday here on Teachers, <laughs> Teachers Talk Radio. <laughs> um, yeah so perfect. schools and school perfect. mentors they really important you can get involved either through the delivery of the curriculum but obviously the placement is the most important part yeah so you know hosting students for placements is a really integral part of how we work well with schools and part of that is having a mentor so from 2024 the requirements for mentoring have significantly increased um so all mentors have to have at least 12 hours of mentor training and i think that's really important wow. for me to clarify that on this platform because it's not the universities or the skits that are saying you need more training that is a new part of the requirements so um for us to be compliant everyone has to have um 12 hours before they even meet their trainee Mm -hmm. and then we have to be able to guarantee that they get between somewhere between four and six hours a week of mentor support so wow. that's a lot it's a big demand on schools yeah, and we but, really, but really reassuring you know for people it going is, into it, is, it it is really reassuring if you're I don't think I had that could... much <laughs> I don't no. remember having that much mentor time so yeah that's really reassuring it is and we really you know it's really important that providers are working with the sector to help people understand what the requirements are so that it's not mm-hmm. super burdensome on um on schools and the and the workload demands for existing teachers but also Mm -hmm. recognizing it's a great skill set to have you know mentor training really upskills you as a practitioner in lots of areas of teaching not just working with trainees so we'd really encourage people to think about whether they do that through an accredited route so some of the work Mm -hmm. we'll be doing will get get master's credits for that mentor training but actually really engaging with it because it makes you a better communicator it makes you a better listener it makes you a better able to problem solve so yeah yeah, partners school placements absolutely vital so again if you're looking for teacher training courses 
do ask your colleagues, you know, how are placements working? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. What schools do you work with? How will I know that I'll have a really positive experience? Those are all good questions to ask. I love that, Jenny. Great. And just, yeah, just great to know that there's such good support in schools at the moment for trainee teachers. Um, So we've got the final 60 seconds and my final question. Um, So if we've got any prospective trainees listening, Jenny, and they're thinking about getting into teaching this morning, they're thinking about what to do for September, for next year, for the future, what is your advice? What are the key things that they should be thinking about before they enroll on a teacher training programme? Okay, so 60 seconds. So you need to be thinking about why. Why do you want to do this? The why is going to see you through from now all the way through your career. So being really, really clear on that why. Have you got the qualifications that you need? Look on the Get Into Teaching website. Just put that into Google or your search engine and it will Mm -hmm. tell you what requirements you need in terms of GCSEs. And if we had more time, I'd go into it. But all of that you can find online. Think about where you want to train. Do you want to stay at home? Do you want to live away from home? What? What are the implications of that for you? Mm -hmm. And then think about, have you got a good understanding of what it means to be a teacher? Talk to some teachers that you Mm -hmm. know, put it out there on social media, ask the questions and really clarifying that why. If I'm interviewing potential trainees, if they've got a strong understanding of what they want to get out of this job and what they think they can contribute, as I said before, to serve the work, not about them, to serve Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. young people that we work with, then they can be trained pretty much anything I can teach you how to manage behavior I can talk to you about assessment and work with you to get that right I can help you understand SEND you don't have to be an expert on that before you apply but we do want that passion that enthusiasm and that clear articulation of what contribution you want to make and I would say go for it it's the best profession in the world oh I feel like I'm welling up Jenny what amazing advice it's so inspirational on a Friday thank you and uh, oh, hopefully we'll have lots pleasure. of people now deciding to sign up as a result to uh, to all the amazing teacher training opportunities out there. So thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. Um, and I just have nothing else to say but to wish you a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. And great to speak to you, Poppy, and uh, the community that you have around you. So do uh, continue the conversation with us. And I'd love to hear any feedback that you've got. So thanks very much. Great to be with you. That's so lovely. Thank you, Jenny. You take care. And to everyone listening, and thanks, Gareth, who's just liked the show with about 10 seconds to go. Really great to have you all here with us. If you're listening back, hope you enjoyed the show, me talking to our wonderful guest, Jenny, here today, and I'll be back with you in a couple of weeks. Enjoy the weekend. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24.